How close is America to total collapse? That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. And I know this is a dark question for the holiday season, but look, we have to have our eyes opened, right? And as we go into the new year, perhaps it might be an opportune moment to reflect on the nation at large, not just make personal resolutions to lose weight, work out more, eat better, and so forth, pay off debt, all worthy pursuits. But what about the state of America? We need to think long and hard how close we are to an utter collapse in this country because republics such as ours We are a republic, not a democracy. Republics historically don't last forever. So how close are we to that time when we fold and bow down to the Marxists, the globalists, the communists, the collectivists who have been actively pursuing America since America's founding days. Before I get into more of that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, at Real Life Network, at WashingtonTimes.com, where you may also subscribe to my three times a week newsletter. It comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, delivered right to your email box, contains the commentaries that I write at the Washington Times, as well as my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. It also includes my occasional video Bold and Blunts. Now and again, when I feel like doing hair and makeup, mostly, I do bold and blunts by video. So make sure and check those out as well. So just go to WashingtonTimes.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, find the newsletter section, click on it, and sign up for Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. That's my newsletter. But you can also get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. Isn't that easy? I want to read you this, this piece, and I purposely looked for for a New York Times or a Washington Post piece on this because I wanted to see what the leftist media outlets in America were reporting. And I find find this, October 29th, 2023, from the New York Times, why illegal border crossings are at sustained highs. The fact that they use the word illegal, right, in the headline in reference to border crossings is a little bit surprising in itself, but this writer goes on to say, and not buried, right? This is the takeaway from the piece. This is the main focus. For the second year in a row, this writer writes, the number of illegal crossings at the U.S.-Mexico border surpassed 2 million, according to government data released this month. The 2022 fiscal year set a record of 2.2 million illegal border crossings. These numbers do not include crossings at official checkpoints, including those migrant crossings in the 2023 fiscal year hit a record high. The fact that even the leftists... New York Times is reporting on the astonishing number of illegals who are crossing the border and being released to points unknown across America. In some instances, with the aid and and taxpayer dollars, right, that the government gives out, the fact that New York Times is even acknowledging that this is taking place in America is news in itself, Because usually the leftist leaning media, like the New York Times, like CNN, like MSNBC, the Washington Post, like even Fox News, I got to say, sometimes, some days, right? Some election days and evenings, which is why I, by and large, don't watch Fox News anymore because of their election coverage. But The fact that leftist-leaning media reports on the shocking numbers that have been taking place at the border with Mexico is telling because usually they are water carriers for Joe Biden's White House, right? Usually the members of the media are water carriers for the Democrat Party in general, 
And every time the Democrat Party makes a misstep, a mistake, lies, deceives, does things that helps our enemies, such as China or Iran or any other number of enemies we have out there, the members of the media oh so helpfully cover up that fact, either lies of omission or outright lies that they report on. So when you see something like the New York Times reporting on record-breaking numbers of illegals crossing into America, then you have to acknowledge that, wow, this really is taking place if, you want, if you're one of those blind people in America. And you also have to acknowledge that it is probably worse than what the New York Times is reporting, right? If even the New York Times is reporting about the record level of illegals crossing into America, then you have to acknowledge that it's probably much worse than that. Otherwise, the New York Times wouldn't feel forced to report. Immigration is a major issue for President Biden, the New York Times writes. No, duh, right? It is for any Democrat because their whole immigration policy is one of roll out the red carpet and let them in and let the taxpayers pay for their hotel stays and their food. And don't make them, don't make them subjected to the same sort of coronavirus restrictions that the legal residents of America have to do. Don't make them get shots. Don't make them social distance. Don't make them even wear face masks if they don't want to. So when you look at just the border issue alone, and this is my point, when you just look at how many illegals are flowing into America from nations where the governments are in place to provide from cradle to grave for the people, where the governments of these nations are socialist and communist and dictatorial in nature, where the people of these nations come to America with expectations that the government is there to give out money, to take from Peter to pay Paul. And they bring that attitude and that mindset and that entitlement, demanding, petulant, whiny mindset and attitude to America, then that alone is enough to crumble America. When you have so many illegals setting up camp at the border, being dispersed around America, set up in states, in Republican states, and Democrats don't cry until the Republicans ship, ship them to the Democrat states or to Martha's Vineyard, right? That alone would cripple America. That alone puts a timeline on how long America's republic can last because you can't keep shipping in socialists and communists and expect that the government structures will stay a republic, will stay limited in scope, right? You bring in more socialists and communists, and then soon enough, their votes count more than patriotic constitutional Americans at the ballot box, and soon enough, they're electing their own. Socialists and communists coming into America, once they start voting more than Americans who understand the exceptionalism of this nation is rooted in limited government with rights coming from God, then those votes get pushed to the side and the socialists and communists win. They win in office, they win in political seats, they win political power, they take over the government, and that in itself is enough to crumble America. But when you add in all this other stuff that's going on in America right now, it is really, really dangerous times. And I have a guest today who has looked at what's taken place in Hungary, which is a very interesting country, as you will hear, and talk to Hungarians who have gone through tyrannical governments in their own nation and are now looking at America with alarm and saying, whoa, hold the phone. The rhetoric that's coming out of America is very similar to the rhetoric that comes out of, say, communist countries. Her name is Shay Bradley Farrell, and I'm happy to say that she is here on Bold and Blunt to talk about her deep dive research into Hungary. Shay, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. It is so great to have you here. Hey, Sarah. 
Carol. Thank you so much for having me on. It's really a privilege. Let's talk about Hungary. You have written a book, Last Warning to the West. What lessons can we learn from Hungary? So many. Uh, I mean, the main premise is that Hungary went through decades of oppression. They were first under Nazi occupation for less than a year, then under Soviet occupation. And what they learned being under that communist type rule was what we need today because, well, let me, let me start with this, this example. When I was in Hungary, uh, maybe about a year ago, one of the things that Hungarians kept saying to me that startled me was that the rhetoric coming out of the United States of America reminded them of the Soviet days. So as I did my research and I really uh, took a dive into why they thought this, it is because uh, the so-called progressivism coming out of the U.S. today, so much of what it is based on, so much of what it is giving to America is similar to what the Hungarians experienced under Soviet occupation. That's alarming, especially when you combine it with the fact, and I'm sure you've heard this as well, that many who have come here from Venezuela or Cuba and they've assimilated because they love this country are now issuing issuing clear warnings that the rhetoric they're hearing in America reminds them of their own tyrannical governments back home. That's absolutely right, especially the authoritarianism of it, the totalitarianism of it the lack of respect for rule of law, Um, the fact that a president, President Trump, former President Trump, has been indicted, um, really, because of uh, political opposition. I believe that the Biden administration is using lawfare uh, against him, much like the Soviets did in Moscow and all around their Soviet satellites, um, where they set up these show trials where, uh, you know, they put people on trial who had done nothing wrong. And I I went on a tour in what is called the House of Terror over there. And uh, what the House of Terror is, is it's where the Soviet uh, police had their headquarters during the occupation. And the Nazis also had their headquarters there, the Aerocross Party. But anyway, um, I asked the guy that was giving me a tour, why did they call them show trials? And, and he said, you know, because people did nothing wrong, but it made them seem wrong. And I, I said, but the Soviets were in power. Why did they need to do this? And he said, because then it changed public opinion. It didn't matter whether or not the person on trial was uh, guilty or not, or they had done anything wrong, but it changed public opinion. So the more you said it, the more people believed uh, that the person on trial was guilty. Hmm. That that is the communist strategy, right? Just keep repeating the lie until it becomes truth in the in the minds of those who are listening. Look, Shay, one of the things that must frustrate the heck out of you is the fact that you do all this deep dive research, right? You spend uh, countless hours writing a book to warn America about the perils of coming communism onto our own onto our own land. And I think most Americans at this point still just kind of go, eh, this is America. It wouldn't happen here. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And that's exactly why I wrote the book, because I care about my country. This book, although it is about Hungary, it has a lot of history about Hungary in it. It is written specifically to Americans to explain to them how communism takes root. And here's one thing that people need to understand, Cheryl. You know, when the Bolsheviks uh, had the revolution in the early 1900s, we can see how it spread, you know, in a very insidious way throughout the world. Some people think that, uh, you know, the calm calm intern, the Communist International, is not a real thing. But it absolutely is a real thing. And let me get some examples of what Bolshevism brought to the world. Legalized abortion on demand, trumpeted trumpeted as health care, the diminishment of parental rights and authority. Part of their strategy was to separate families, to separate children from their parents, to separate families from religion. 
Because if you can do that, then they have the uh, authorities, so to speak, have more control. Um, they also brought about more liberalization of marriage and divorce laws that you know we see leading to the decay of the the family. So it's not just uh, the political uh, pushing back against politi political opponents and uh, using lawfare for that. But there's so much the so-called progressivism. In the words of Viktor Orban, who is the prime minister of Hungary, he says it is the same, very, very similar as to what they experienced under communist rule. And he's one of the freedom fighters that, find, that pushed and pushed one day until finally the Soviets uh, began to lose power. So I think I might have got off the question you asked me, but uh, that's so much important information for Americans to understand. So that list that you just cited, that's all here now. And what was most alarming on that list when you spoke about the separation of religion, right, from the people, if you look back under the coronavirus years here in America and churches closing at bureaucrats' dictates, right, no laws passed, uh, nobody, uh, a duly passed piece of legislation ordering churches to close, which would have been trounced in court. But the fact that churches closed down, that must be really alarming to you as well. It, it absolutely is, and it's a, a perfect example of what we're talking about. If you'll remember during that time, there there was a real fight to keep abortion clinics open. Yes. But we had to close churches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. There are so many similarities to the so-called, I say so-called progressivism, because it's not progressive at all. It leads to the destruction of society. But there's so many parallels. If you look at the Soviets, at the communists, they uh, were also trying to divide people along class lines, along ethnic lines. We're doing that here today. The Biden administration is doing that wholeheartedly. Um, many leftists are, are doing that. But we're also dividing people along the lines of gender. We're fighting about who's a man and who's a woman now. Um, so there's just so many parallels to that. Um, and I, I guess just to finish what I was saying is progressivism, it's, it is not progressive for society. If you look at, Cheryl, our open borders right now, we don't know who's coming in. We have record numbers of people who have died from fentanyl-related drugs, higher numbers than ever before. We don't know who's in this country. Uh, we don't know uh, if they are criminals. I remember the first year uh, during Biden that I did look up the stats on that, and we had more murderers coming in. It, was, it had jumped something like 120 percent since, you know, before uh, when Trump was in office that they knew of repeat offenders coming back into our country. Uh, you look at the fact that we're pushing on children that they should cut off their body parts or so-called transition to another sex before they even know who they are, uh, suppressing free speech, uh, like you just referred to. In, in my view, it's a, a hate of Christianity. I mean, look at uh, Pelosi and Harris, who have really applauded the degradation of cities around America. So that's why I'm saying it's not progressive. It's destructive to our society. Let me ask a question specific to um, Hungary right now. Viktor Orban, who is probably hated only second to Donald Trump, right, by the globalists, by the left around the world. He's been pushing right. back against, you know, woke EU policies and so forth, open borders and the LGBTQ agenda, and yet he does not want to exit the European Union. Can you talk about the, the, reason, the reasons, the rationale behind that? Yeah, actually, I asked many Hungarians that question. One of the really cool things that I got to do with my book is, uh, you know, I did research, historical data, took tours, these kind of things. But I also got to go talk to regular people out in the country. Uh, one of the places I went was the hometown of Viktor Orban. It was pretty interesting. But I also talked to very high-up senior officials in the government 
And I asked everybody a lot of the same questions, and I put that question to them many times. And the answer that I got was that when you're having a fight with your family, <laughs> you're still family. So Interesting. they want to remain in the family. So I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think also it's economically secure for them to remain. Um, and one thing you really learn, Cheryl, when you're in Central Europe, in Hungary is that they're not only geographically between the East and the West, they're between the East and West in many different ways. And they believe that they have to balance the relationships between the two for their survival. And uh, if you look back at their history, if you read my book, uh, you will see how they have had to balance it, uh, balance their uh, relations uh, on many different levels between the countries that they're in between, between the regions they're between. Uh, they're a very small country. they are 10 million people. So uh, that's what I believe it has a lot to do with. But that's, that's a great question. Um, let, let's jump back to your book now, Last Warning to the West. So in your research, and, and kind of detail how your re- research went. I know you said you went over there. How long were you there? Um, did, did you travel the whole country? Uh, just some specifics on that. But in your book, Last Warning to the West, what do you see, um, based on your research, as maybe the final countdown moments that America has to save itself from communism? Those are excellent questions. So I'll just give you a little overview. I I started going to Hungary in 2019 and just sort of built a relationship with many different people over there, did some work with the government, um, you know, from my organization, Counterpoint Institute, and another policy organization I was with, and got to know them and their history. And it is fascinating. They... They became a Christian Western nation a thousand years ago. They had a king called King Istvan who decided, you know, that he was going to make sure Hungary was part of the West. Because, like I said, they've always had this geographical and political balance between the two. But he wanted Hungary to be a Christian nation, um, and they still are today. And so this was a thousand years ago. But... During that thousand years, they've been occupied by the Ottoman Turks, by the Habsburg, uh, the Habsburg uh, monarchy, and, and then they shared the monarchy at one at a certain point. But they've had to fight off and on for their own survival, their own national identity. And so I became fascinated to find out what that identity meant to them, um, and. Because part of it is the fight. They believe the fight is part of their identity. They have to stand firm for their own belief, who they are, and they are a country that believes in God, family, and homeland. And then, like I I said earlier, Nazi occupation in 1944, Soviet occupation from 1945 to 1991. All through this, they have remained true to who they are to Christianity, which if you hear the stories from some of the older people that I talked to who were children at the time of the Soviet occupation, you realize it was very difficult to hold on to that uh, Christian belief. They they had to hide it in their homes and not be too uh, public about what they believed, uh, believing in Jesus Christ. But they, so they've held on to it. So the first thing I would say, they're an example because They've been through the communism. They see the progressivism that we're dealing with right now as communism. But they came out of it on the other side as still embracing God, family, and homeland. And, you know, Viktor Orban, I I admire him. Uh, One of the reasons, because he sticks to his beliefs. I mean, Cheryl, they have set up this law recently, which is why the EU is having such a fight with them, that says, no, you will not put gender, transgender ideology into our schools. You will not show transgender ideology to our children. They've put their foot down about this. Um, Say no to the woke agenda is one of the slogans. They just will not do it, and they do it with a smile on their face. They don't try to, um, they don't get angry, 
or irritable about it, at least not publicly. So they know how to push back. They know how to fight. And this is the last thing I'll say, Cheryl, and then I'll, I'll shut up. But uh, Victor Orban put out 12 points, and I have those 12 points in my book, and they are such a model for what conservatives should be doing today, such as uh, take the media. And, and let me explain this, because many people in the press say that Orban has nationalized the media. That's not true. It's all private media. There have, are conservatives that have put money into having more of the media, and it's about a 50-50 split conservative and uh, liberal media in Hungary. It's just that the liberals are mad that they're not in the majority any longer <laughs> um, as far as that. And like Another example is um, build institutions that teach traditional conservative Christian principles. Um, so anyway, which is leads me to the Center for Fundamental Rights, who is publishing my book. They are a conservative and Christian-based uh, institution. But there are many things that I believe conservatives over the, here in the U.S. need to do to be on the offensive in our strategy and not defensive, because certainly the radical left is well-funded and well-strategized. I think that's an excellent point you just made about going on the offense instead of uh, playing defense and catch up all the time. That's the problem with conservatives in America, it seems like. We're, we're too afraid to go on the offense. And just to finish with this last question, if you could just address, address the second point, I, I suppose by reading your book, uh, last warning to the West and the 12 points that you just uh, detailed that you could probably draw conclusions about where we stand in America um, from being to the 12th hour of doomsday. But could you just give one or two maybe ideas about how close we are to that time of total crumbling in America? Hmm. Well, I wish I knew, Cheryl, but I know that we are closer than we have been at least in the past century. Um, it is, we are at a revolutionary time, and it's been a violent time as well. Thank God it has not moved over into warfare yet. But uh, the problem is, I believe, fundamentally, the psychological aspects of it. Um, if you, this is very interesting, it's what I wrote about in my book as well. In 1959, our Department of Defense uh, published a strategy manual about fighting communist psychological warfare. And I also put, uh, the I think it's 10 points uh, out of this book that uh, ca uh, characterizes what communist psychological warfare looks like, what it does. Um, and if you look at those, you will recognize every single one of them in our society right now. You referred to covid that was a time when it was a crisis was used uh, for the government to gain more power and more control over Americans. That's one of the points written about in 1959 uh, that the communists were doing in the Soviet Union. And it was a warning about communism spreading into America. And it has, actually. So I would say we're very close, Cheryl, which is, I, I'm a very optimistic person. Um, I believe in prayer, and I believe in God. And I'm not only praying, but I am also working and trying to get the word out. It's why I wrote the book. It's why I'm doing media to get the word out, because I believe there are so many Americans today that if they could understand and recognize what's going on, that they would stop it and that they would get involved in their communities, in their school boards, in their city councils, and they would stop this because we are at a, a very dangerous place right now. And, and Cheryl, one more thing, if I may, recognize when you're getting this uh, psychological propaganda, that, that was one of the um, 10 points also that was written about in this strategic manual, is that the radicals will use language to capture the minds and the hearts of people. And start, so start recognizing that, uh, even words like Bidenomics, <laughs> when you know that the economy is failing, uh, words like sexual reproductive health, which means we're trying to get access to abortion, words like gender 
Gender used to mean the difference between a male and female when you're, we were talking about gender uh, diversity. So they're taking over the language. But just start to recognize when you are being uh, hit with propaganda. I think that's the first step. And, and how about Joe Biden calling uh, for patriots to take the COVID shots? And if you did not take the shots as he wanted, then you were not patriotic. So I, I, I see how the language is often used by the left to exert its wills. And I'm so glad you wrote this book. I, I'm a little bit jealous. You got to go to Hungary and do all that deep research. What a phenomenal uh, book this must be. Shea Bradley Farrell, Last Warning to the West. Thank you so much for being on Bold and Blonde. It was great ch chatting with you. Farrell, it, it was such a pleasure. And your last example was spot on. And may I just say that it, it will be up on Amazon on December 7th. And uh, also you can find a link to it at counterpointinstitute.org. Thank you so much for having me on, Cheryl. Thank you. What a dire warning for America, and spot on, too. I want to thank you for listening. Remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, at Real Life Network, at WashingtonTimes.com, and wherever podcasts are offered. Tune in next time. In the meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.